Masechet Baba Batra, Daf Samech Gimel. We're in the middle of talking about people who use ambiguous language when they are selling or giving a field or uh, giving away as an inheritance. And the language was, is difficult to parse, and we have to figure out uh, when they say certain borders and we don't know what they mean. Uh, the last example was uh, someone who says palga, uh, half of the land, versus pisika, a part of the land. And uh, we were analyzing, do these, does this really mean necessarily half? and this means a piece, meaning a tiny piece, or not necessarily. Paga really means, it could also mean to cut, and Pasak also uh, cut a division. So it was necessarily a half or a smallest division, and so we ended up saying that it will depend on if they say an extra phrase, um, these are the boundaries, and that means it's more, or if they miss that extra phrase and don't say it, that means it would be less. And so now we're going to um, talk about some other phrases and exactly what they might mean. Peshita. Amar yachlok peloni bin chasai palga. So we understand as a simple and obvious matter that if someone says, um, this person should get a chelik, he should share in my property a chelik. Standard definition of chelik is one half. Although chelik also technically could mean a part. Kol Yisrael Yeshlehem chelik, lo'olam haba, means everybody has a share in the world to come. It's, uh, that's probably not a half. Because uh, then that, that's it. There would only be two people in the world to come, uh, each having half. So chelik could certainly mean a small piece. Uh, but in the standard language, if someone says, I want to lachalok, ya chalok peloni bin chasai, um, as a verb, let him split the, the property that I have, then he's giving that person a half, whether it be as a gift or as a sale, or if he's giving it as an inheritance, that's, that would definitely mean one half. However, if he says, tenu chelek liploni bin chasai, mai, if he says, give a portion, it's the same root, yachalok and chelek, but yachalok as a verb, that generally means a half. But give a portion, well, how much is that? Is it the same, also a half? Or does it mean a small portion? And if so, how small? That's the question. And we have an answer. Amar Avina Bar Kisi Tashema Detanya Haomer Tenuchelik Ploni Bebor Sumchus Omer En Pachot Merebiya. So Ravina Bar Kisi says we can learn it from the following Braita. If someone says, give a portion of uh, the water in a cistern to someone else. Some say it's wine, but the board generally is water. And so he says, give a portion. So how much are you going to give? The maximum ma- amount would be half, because chelek lachalok, if it was a verb, then that would mean half. So does that mean you give him half? Or chelek maybe is just a tiny bit. Maybe just give him one little handful uh, from of water from the cistern, just uh, uh, something that is a portion, a small portion. So what, what does this mean? Sumchus has an answer. Now, as soon as we see Sumchus, we have to remember that Sumchus is of the opinion that Mamon hamutal besafek holkin. That's his general principle, um, as opposed to hamosim echaved or lavad That whoever is uh, taking money, he has to bring the proof. Or shuda didaini that the judges will uh, adjudicate, decide on their uh, based on their own estimation. There are other ways to solve such problems. Sumchus is famous for saying, whenever you have money and there's a doubt about uh, who it belongs to. You split it 50-50, even if one guy's holding it, uh, well, but there's a, a reason to think that it's not his, so they split it 50-50. And he's going to apply that uh, that um, methodology here as well. And so Sumchu says, in this case, this, the owner of the, of the cistern has to give a not less than a quarter. Well, how do we get a quarter? As follows. The maximum that the seller might have meant is a half of the water in the board, because uh, lachalok, as a verb, means a half. It's not more than a half, for sure. So it's uh, the maximum is a half. The minimum is uh, just a few drops, right? Uh, a portion. Here, take a little cupful. So, you know, basically almost zero. So that's the man- maximum and minimum. And therefore, since it's mamon and mutal besafek, the half, the, the buyer is claiming, I own, I, I, I get half. 
And the seller is uh, saying, no, uh, he meant, or the seller's uh, descendant or whoever is saying, uh, no, he meant only uh, a few drops. So therefore, since a half of the board is under consideration, contestation, so we take half of that. And we give the buyer uh, half of the half, which is a quarter, and the seller keeps the, uh, their, uh, the, the rest of it, the three quarters. Since only a half of it was contested to begin with, so that half is halved, and he gets a quarter. And so that would be the answer. That's what we do. And he's not, he's not actually giving a definite answer that chelik means a half or means uh, one cup. He's saying, well, it's ambiguous language. And when we have ambiguous language, this is how we will deal with it. So that's the answer for chelik. Um, we go on to show other examples. Lechavit and pachot mishiminit. If someone says, give to that person, tenu chelik liploni bebod lechavit. Give that person a portion of water from the cistern so that he can fill his barrel. Now, what did that mean? Um, a a full, totally full barrel or not? A standard size of a barrel is half of the water in a standard size cistern. So, um, if it would be a full barrel, then that would still, that would already be half of what's in it. And he, or, and he said, chilek. The chilek is going on the chavit, meaning don't fill up the chavit totally. Tenu chilek, from the, from the cistern, give a, a portion of the filling of the barrel. So the maximum that he might mean is half of the barrel, which is itself a quarter of the cistern. Now, that's the maximum, but the minimum is zero. So between a quarter and zero, we go to the middle, and he gives only one eighth. And similarly, regarding a kedera, say he says, a seller says, give to that person from my cistern a portion to fill up his pot, a pot. Um, so a pot is a general uh, standard size, is one third of a uh, of a board. So that would be a full pot. Now he said chelik. So the maximum that he might be uh, might be giving uh, would be one sixth because right that would be half a full kid that has a third of the board and half of that would be one sixth so the maximum is one sixth but maybe chelik means just a tiny bit and therefore we go to the middle and the middle between one sixth and zero is one twelfth so he gets at least one twelfth and and lastly the tafiach and pachot mishisha asad if if he says um give to that person from the cistern, a portion for his um, a cup. Uh, now, a cup is only a quarter. Uh, the uh, standard cup size is a quarter of uh, what's in the cistern. Now, the maximum that he might have even thought of giving him is half of that, which is an eighth. So the maximum is an eighth, but maybe he meant zero, and therefore um, he gets uh, at least one sixteenth. Um, because that is what that would be. And there you go. Now we have an answer. That's very important. When you say lahalok, the standard usage of lahalok as a verb means to cut in half. But chalik as a noun means a portion. And we don't know what size that portion is. And so sumchos applies his ruling that you split the, you split it down the middle between the maximum and minimum possibilities. Tenora banan. Ben Levi Shemachasa de Israel, Amarlo, Amenache Maaserishon Sheli, Maaserishon Shelo. As someone who's a Levi, and he sells, he owns a field, he sells it to a Israel, a non Levi. And he says, Listen, I'm selling you this field on condition that when you grow produce and you take Maaserishon, Maaserishon goes to a Levi, usually a farmer can pick any Levi he wants. He can pick his friend, he can pick his neighbor, he can pick a poor person, anyone. Uh, any levy. But now this the seller says, I'm selling you on condition that you will give the tithe to me. I'm a levy. Does that work? And the answer is yes. He owns, he gets an automatic claim to that ma'asir. Vimamari li ul banai met yeten lebanav. And if he said, I'm selling you this field on condition that you give not only me the ma'asir ishon, but after I die, that you will give it to my sons, who are obviously also Levi'im. And then he dies, then the owner has to give it to his sons, because that's, that's the condition. The Braita continues. And if he says that I'm, sell, I, I'm, I, I'm selling you this field on condition that you give me the Ma'asir 
all the time that the field is in your possession. So then it was, he sells the field. Okay, it's in the buyer's possession. He has to give the maser to the levy. But if that buyer himself sold it to a third person and then bought it back, then he does not have to give to the levy anything. The levy has no claim upon him uh, because he already fulfilled his obligation. As long as I own it from this sale, then he has to give to the levy. But then once he sells it, now it's out of his hands. That's it. The condition is there, there by null and void because that buyer doesn't have to give it to the levy. So when he buys it back, he's buying it back with all the rights that that, buy, that's, that, that buyer, the third party buyer, who's now a seller, uh, selling it back had, and he didn't have to give it to a levy. So once you sell it, then the condition is null and void, even if he buys it back and owns it again. And now we ask, we ask about the main law uh, up here. Am I? En adam olam. How could it be that the Levi keeps the right or acquires the right to the ma'asir that will grow in the future, next year and the year after and the year after? How could that work? Because that does not yet exist. And we have a principle that you cannot transfer something that does not yet exist in the world. I, in order to make a transfer, I have to have something in my hand and give it to you. Or if it's out there, uh, currently existing in the field, we can do some kind of transaction to give you what's there that's already grown in the field. But you're talking about you know buying and selling futures. Uh, the future right for what will grow. How can you make an acquisition on something that does not exist right now? So how could this how could this function? How could it work? Even though you said on condition, on condition that you acquire something that will exist only in the future. And the answer is since when the Levi sold the land, he said, on condition that Maaser Rishon is mine. So even though he didn't say explicitly what the, uh, the, uh, the, what the mechanism will be, what he must have meant to say, in other words, we insert this following interpretation in his words. Even if he didn't say it, maybe he didn't even mean it uh, explicitly. Uh, but um, since he certainly wanted to uh, get the Maaser, so we interpreted his words as if he said, that he wants to withhold some of the land, that land from which the Maaser will grow. So you have a big field that's 100 square feet, and uh, a tenth of what grows is going to be Maaser. So in effect, the Levi is saying, I'm selling you the whole field, but I'm holding back for myself the right to take whatever will grow on the a tenth of that of the land, right? Wherever it will be, you you decide where where you're going to take maaser from, whichever part that you to separate from. That is in effect my land, and the land does exist right now. So I can acquire, I can not only acquire the land, I certainly can keep the land that I already own. So we interpret his words to mean that um, uh, I uh, I'm, I'm holding back for myself that amount of land, that piece of land from which Maaser Rishon will grow, and that does exist, so therefore, it's not uh, that we resolve the problem of Davar Shelo Ba'ala Olam. Good. Amar Resh Lakish Zot Omeret. These are going to be key words that we're going to discuss in a minute. Resh Lakish is learning something extra from this B'raita. He's going to compare this case that we just had uh, to another case. What is, what is he learning from? From the, this analysis of the Baraita. The analysis of the Baraita is that when a person says, when a Levi says, um, I'm selling you the field on condition that I keep my Serishon, we extend his statement. Even though he didn't say it explicitly, we interpret it in such a way that that will be true. And a we insert a mechanism by which um, he can take the Maaserishon. Um, and that mechanism is that he retains the rights to some of the land. So when he says a phrase, we add an extension, um, uh, an interpretation that is an extension of his words um, in order to make them true. Okay, that principle, the Shakish is going to learn something from it. So Zotomerit. If someone sells a house to his friend or a residence to his friend and he says on condition that the upper part is mine. In that case, the upper part is his. Now, what are we talking about when he says this upper part? It could be an upper story or an upper row of, uh, of, of bricks. So what exactly does that mean? In fact, we would know this already because we already saw in the Mishnah 
that when I say I'm selling you a residence, what I mean by that is the main residence, the first floor. If there's an attic, then I, we assume that the attic is not included in the sale because that second floor or the, or the, um, uh, the, the roof, we assume, is not, let's say it's a roof that has a fence around it, that's its own area, and that's not included in the sale. So really, why would he have to say these extra words on condition that the upper story is mine? I am keeping that for myself. That's actually obvious. Um, uh, so even if the seller didn't say this, it would still be his. So what does, uh, what does this mean? What is he adding here? And we're going to see two opinions. Right? And when, when Resh Lakish says, um, oh, see, I can derive that when someone adds this phrase, then he gets the upper story. In fact, he's getting the upper story, keeping the upper story anyway. So there's two opinions. Rav Zavid says that if the seller decides that he wants to put projections, um, hooks sticking out for, out of the um, the the roof, uh, the the upper story, he can do so. Even though here's the chidush, even though these projections are going to overhang into the courtyard of the other guy, uh, the buyer who owns that, who's who's uh, buying that courtyard as well, or owns that courtyard. Um, so um, even though if you didn't say anything, I just said I'm selling you this residence, then you'd only get that residence, the first floor, and you don't get the roof. So that's automatically built in. If I say, oh, I'm keep, I'm withholding for myself the roof. There's no need to say that because that's already true. So we see that an extra phrase comes to add something else that's not explicit in the phrase. That's the that's the zot um, zot omeret. And what is that extra thing that is coming to include? It's including the right to a little bit of the airspace over the courtyard of the buyer that I can put. I'm sticking these hooks into the roof and the roof is mine, and even though it's overhanging, that's that I'm permitted to do that. Uh, so this is what Reshakish when he said when he meant uh, 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 meant when he said Zotomere, just like for the Levi, we take his words, but we add um, we add something to his words that he meant not only that he gets the Maaseri Shon, but he also gets a right to the land um, because otherwise these words would be meaningless. So to hear these words would be meaningless because he gets the roof anyway. So we, we have to add something to it, and this is what we add, some a little bit of the airspace. So Rav Zavid is all good. And then Rav Papa Amar, Shim Rasalibnot Aliyah Al Gaba Bone. Rav Papa says this means that if the seller who keeps the right to the roof or the upper story, if he wants to build on it, he can build. If there was already an attic uh, there, so certainly has the right to the attic, and even if it falls, he can rebuild it. Um, but the wording here actually says to build it, which sounds like even if he um, he sells the bayit, he retains the right to the uh, to the roof, and included in that right is also that I can build on the roof. Not only that I can go walk around and put stuff on the roof, I can also build another story on top of it. That's what a papa says is the extra thing that we're going to derive. Now the papa statement is problematic because. That right, he also already has. When I sell you uh, a residence, it means the first floor, and without saying otherwise, I keep the upper story or the roof, and uh, if, if it has a fence around it. And so therefore, I have a right to do whatever I want on the roof, including to build something up there. So actually, according to that papa, we don't understand what the zot omedit is. What are you deriving? What's the comparison to the case of the Levi? The, in the case of the Levi, we added um, another right that he didn't say. That, that was the right to the land. But the Papa is not really adding any right here by saying this phrase. That's what we ask next. We understand according to Rav Zavid, that explains well what Uresh Lakish meant when he said Zot Omeret. He's making a proper comparison. Just like the Levi only said, I want to retain the right to the Maser Rishon. But included in that right, 
in that phrase, we add, oh, he must have meant that he gets the land also. Otherwise, he wouldn't get the Maaser Rishon because it didn't, it didn't exist in the world yet. Um, so, Resh Akish says, oh, that's very interesting. I'm going to apply the same principle to another case where someone says, I am selling you the residence, but I am keeping the upper story. Well, he gets the upper story anyway. So why is he saying that? Oh, we'll interpret it that he has, in addition, another right, a right to put hooks over the airspace. That makes sense. But a papa, uh, if, uh, according to a papa's interpretation of Reshakish, there is no connection between this Diuta case and the Levi case. There's no reason for him, Reshakish, to say Zotomeret, because, in fact, there is nothing being added to that we would not have known, um, even if he didn't say that phrase. Um, if he just said, I'm buying this house, then he, uh, I'm selling you this house, then you, uh, then I keep the upper story and I can build on it. And this extra phrase, the upper story is mine, is not adding anything that isn't already explicit in the statement. And so we leave that as a question. So Rav Dimi from Narda says, if someone is selling a house to his friend, even though he wrote, I'm selling you the house, the, the depth and the height, even if he writes that, he, sh- he must also write that the, you should acquire for yourself the depths all the way down to the depths of the earth, and the heights all the way up to the sky. You should add that also. It's not enough just to say depth and height, but depth down to the bottom of the uh, uh, deep, uh, the, the deep down, and all the way up to the sky. That's what he said. Now, my Tama, why? Why do you have to add these words? What will it add that you wouldn't have otherwise? De umka viduma bistama la kane. Ahani umka viduma limikna umka viduma. So we explain. There's actually three different levels of what a person might mean when he's selling a home. So, umka and ruma, that is referring to the basement and the upper story, the attic. Um, and now if you don't say anything at all, these are not sold. If I say, I'm selling you my the house, or more, maybe more accurately, a residence. I'm selling you the resi- this residence. You only get the first floor. That's the main residence. And if I don't say anything else, then you assume that I am keeping for myself the rights down and the rights up, the basement if it's there, or the right to dig a basement, and the rights on top if there's a second floor, or the right to uh, build a second floor. That's if you don't say anything at all. Now, if I include in the deed, I'm selling you this residence, its depth and its height, then that will include the basement and the attic um, and the rights to the uh, to that to those areas um, for which for living space. All that is a, a residential living space. Now, if you only have have that, then you still don't have everything. If you write, however, from the depth of the earth to the height of the sky, then that will include not only the basement but also the pit and cisterns and tunnels that are there in the house under uh, in the basement or uh, associated with that house. Now, why would those not be included in just saying basement? Because they're different usage. The basement is used for living. So if I say a house and its depth, then you get all the living space, which is whatever there is, in, is there in the basement, as living space. But a cistern is not living space. That's a separate entity. It's a separate usage. As we saw yesterday, even if it's smaller uh, than 4 by 4 it's a separate usage, and therefore is not included in the sale, even if you write um umma. Um umma only includes the basement and the attic. The depth of the earth and the height of the sky, that will include pits and cisterns and things that are of other usage, maybe some kind of air rights that are uh, independent of, uh, uh, of living space, I don't know, putting like a big antenna on the roof or something. Um, so then in order to include that, you have to write the extra phrase. So that's Rav Dimi from Narda, who says there are, there are these three levels, saying nothing, saying depth and height, and saying the deep depth and the height up to the sky. Let's try to bring this our Mishnah in order to support what Avdimi said. The Mishnah said, The Mishnah is coming up on uh, the next half. 
ולא את הבור ולא את הדות, אף על פי שכתב לו אומכה ודומה. The Mishnah says, if I sell you a residence, and that's all, I just say that, then you get, you get the, the house itself, um, the, uh, the, whatever, the first floor, um, but you do not get the pit or the cistern. And even if you're right, even if I write, I'm the self, I write in, as the seller, I write in the deed, the depth and the height, still uh, the cistern does not go. So that seems to support uh, Rav Dimi. Rav Dimi would say the same thing. That's what he just said. That it's not enough to write umka veruma to include the cistern. You have to write the depth down to the earth. Now, if you would think that by saying nothing, just saying I'm selling you the residence, that that would include the basement and the upper story, if you would think that, then... If you write um kaviduma, these are extra words. Those extra words have to mean something. That would it sounds like that would then include the pits, the cistern, and the tunnel. Uh, but the Mishnah does not say that. The Mishnah says that even if you write um kaviduma, you still don't get the cistern. That makes sense according to Rav Dimi. What do you have to write if you want? You want the cistern? You have to write the depth down uh, all the way down to the earth. Okay, so this seems to be a good proof for Rav Dimi. But the Gemara says uh, not necessarily. The Mishnah could be talking about de la Katavle, a case where he did not write umka viruma. Now this is a very difficult thing to, thing to say because the Mishnah actually says even if he writes umka viruma. So what do you mean? They're talking about a case where he didn't write it. The Mishnah just said even if you wrote it. So the Gemara quickly um, uh, explains. But the Mishnah says even if you write umka viruma, the cistern is not included. So what did you mean by this answer? The Gemara explains. Even if one did not write the phrase umka viruma, it's as if one wrote it at least to uh, acquire the basement and the roof. In other words, if someone didn't write anything at all, they just said, I'm selling you the, the home, then that will not include the cistern. And even if you don't write it, by the way, it will be as if you included, uh, as if you said the basement and the attic, that's already included. Right, we're reading the Mishnah this way. This is against Rav Dimi because we want to show that this is not the Mishnah is not necessarily a proof. Um, it isn't, we don't have to read the Mishnah this way, but we're tr we're trying to explain uh, the Mishnah in a way that will not be a proof because you just said it definitely is a proof. So the way that you can explain that it's not a proof that's against Rav Dimi is that listen, if you write nothing in the document, then that automatically includes the basement and the attic, as if you wrote basement and attic. So therefore, writing nothing includes basement and attic, and you don't have to write um kaviduma just for the basement and the attic. Now, if you want to um, have the buyer acquire the pit, the cistern, or the tunnels, then if you write the phrase um kaviduma, then the cistern goes and is part of the sale, but if you don't write it, then it's not part of the sale. So according to this interpretation of the Mishnah, uh, which is against Rav Dimi, there's really only two levels. If you write nothing at all, then we assume not only the first floor, but also the basement and the attic. That's all included in the, uh, not the, uh, fra the, the standard phrasing without any extra words. Therefore, if you do add words, um uma, then it has to be adding something else. What else is it adding? If the basement is already included, oh, that must be adding the cistern. So the Mishnah could be read in that way, and therefore it's, this is not necessarily a proof for Rav Dimi. However, this is somewhat of a difficult reading because you have to uh, fit, these, fit the words into it, and so therefore it could very well uh, be that the Mishnah um, is in line, or rather that Rav Dimi is in line with the Mishnah. We're just saying that this is not necessarily a 100% proof. Baruch Adonai Le'olam, Amen ve'amen.